Hey, I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally. Hope life is good for everybody. We've got a couple of questions, and uh, so we're going to jump right into them. So I'm going to pop over to the Facebook page for the group. And Sri is asking about stomach acid. So she says acid is produced as soon as, as soon as protein hits the stomach walls. That makes sense. And then if acid is only produced to break down protein, then why do vegans also suffer from GERD? And so both of, so that first thing is actually not correct, Sri. Um, stomach acid should be starting to be produced when your dog starts to chew. So th remember, there's sort of when, when we eat, and I think we went through this in a previous session, but when you eat, you start to see, or your dog eats, you, you see the food, you start to salivate a little bit so that the amylase in your saliva can start to break down some of the starches, and this should also start the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So it doesn't mean that when the food hits the, hydro the stomach that there's hydrochloric acid present, but it begins to, to be produced. Now, it is not used only to break down protein. Hydrochloric acid is a general acid, and so it's going to start to digest everything. And it will also start to kill bacteria or viruses, things of that nature, that may be on the food itself. And so this is one of the ways that we end up with food issues, is that uh, when we don't produce stomach acid, then we have all this food coming into our system that is sort of un cleaned, if you will, um, and, you know, and as clean as you can be with any, any type of food preparation, um, it, it's still, there are still things present that could potentially harm us, and so this is one of the jobs for stomach acid. So when the stomach acid gets produced, then that be, you know, sits there and mixes with whatever is in the stomach, starts to break down all of the food macronutrients, the fat, the protein, the carbohydrates, the plants, all of that, and again starts to produce the, uh, you know, the clean things up a little bit. So why do vegans get uh, um, GERD? For the same reason that the rest of us do, because there is a disconnect between the, the, the digestive process. The stomach acid is not produced until after the food has actually left the stomach. And so all of a sudden, there's all this acid being produced in the stomach, and boom, um, you've got uh, a gastric reflux. And so the, the acid starts to come up into the esophagus and creates all sorts of unfun issues. So how do you get around this? One is uh, if you're people, if you're a human, you can chew. So there's this old concept of fletcherizing your food, and so you're supposed to chew each mouthful of food one uh, one time for each te tooth, so that's 32 chews per mouthful, right? And this helps to kind of break down the food a little bit more effectively. Same concept with cooked food. Um, the food is already slightly pre-digested, and so there's not quite as much work for the um, for the stomach to do. And then. Thirdly, this is where people will use things like betaine hydrochloride, um, and we can experiment with that in pets, although it can be a little tricky. Um, so this is where betaine hydrochloride would be used, and the rule of thumb in people is that with, you know, day one you would give, you would use one capsule of betaine hydrochloride with each meal, and see if that you know, if, if that's okay, you don't get any heartburn, um, then the next day you would use two capsules per meal and so on and so forth until you get up to seven and then you are effectively self-diagnosed as hypochlorotic uh, or low acid producer. And that's when they tell you to go see the doctors and they don't know what to do so they just put you on, on uh, Pepsid or some sort of acid reducer to prevent the symptomatology that you're getting. So I hope that helps, Sri. I cannot remember when we talked about this before, but um, that was, we, I went through the whole digestive process in detail. 
So I think you can search that here and actually probably on the members area would be a better, better place to, so to take a look as well. And Kathy is saying that um, after a month regarding Dottie and Daisy's diets, um, no more throwing up. Grass eating has been reduced but not eliminated, but they are scratching and licking more. And Kathy, if you saw this start to happen just when you began to use the Mega Mucosa, that it may have something to do with it in terms of um, initially you may see things get a little bit worse uh, as far as itching and things of that nature as the gut starts to heal. So don't quite, I don't think there's any, you know, because they've not had stevia or monk fruit, I don't think that's probably a big deal. Um, it's something I'm taking myself and it is not, it's more just a flavor, so not a huge component of it. Um, so don't give up yet. Give it a few more days and see if things don't start to improve. And then, of course, you can use um, quercetin to help control symptomatology for a few days as well. And then the other thing to be mindful of is you are in L.A. And I'm wondering if you're starting to see some of the spring uh, pollens come out that may be creating the itching. So think on that, too. Uh, let's see, Daisy's coat is shinier and she's more active and their coats appear to be thicker. Great. Um, they're pooping once a day, so great. That's awesome um, because what's happening is they're able to get all of the nutrients out of the food before it goes down into the large colon. And hardly, Daisy hardly drinks water except for the water she puts in the meals. And that's fine. Uh, that's pretty normal. And then they pee on all their walks, which also is normal. They're probably marking. Um, and then, yeah, go for another month and then start adding in, um, start testing foods to see what they can handle and not ha handle. Um, so I would, again, go for another month to get things as good as they are so you know what's happening. And Daisy CBD oil is continuing, but at an elevated dosage. So, Kathy, I mean, that all sounds really good. Uh, you're seeing pretty significant improvement. So the one thing to keep in mind is, is it springtime and stuff is blooming and that's why they're itchy? Or is it because the, they're truly sensitive to something in the mega mucosa or is the mega mucosa just kind of starting to heal the gut and in some of that die off you're starting to see them be a little more itchy. So keep us posted on that. That's really great. Um, May is asking about uh, CBDE's formula and it does have um, mostly lavender in it. Excuse me. Uh, frankincense and myrrh and so you know what you could consider doing is just getting a plain CBD and uh, you know week on the ease week on the plain stuff to rotate through the essential oils because um, you're right we do start to kind of acclimatize to them for lack of a better descriptor and I think that's what we've got here so let me pop over to the sheet and make sure I've got all the questions answered uh, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to talk with you about is uh, the iPets Ally monthly thing. And unfortunately, but, well, not unfortunately, because I always enjoy talking with Bettina. We have a really great conversation about once a month. But um, Bettina was sort of the only person that meant, meant, made the, made the uh, broadcast. Um, what we talked about were low methionine diets. And so these are used, these are now being discussed on the human side for cancer control. And in fact, the concept has been around since the mid 70s, but like a lot of ideas in nutrition, it got dismissed for quite some time. But now on the human side, that the Mediterranean diet is the thing that cures everything, um, there is a lot more interest and discussion about what can we do with how we're eating to manipulate how we respond to a certain disease or to prevent disease. And so the keto diet, the premise of that in cancer is that it creates a starvation state chronically and it is meant to be a short-term therapeutic diet. And after seven years on basically the keto diet, I can tell you exactly why. My body went into such a uh, state of starvation that a lot of systems started shutting down and it turns out that's where a lot of my gut issues were coming from. So 
And there are other people and dogs that do great with this life lifelong. But for, you know, so think of everything in a bell-shaped curve, right? And you've got the center is sort of like, oh, there's the camera, 80% of the population, and then the outer 10% to either side are the outliers. And so these are the people that do great on a vegan diet or great on an all-meat diet or great on keto or whatever it is, whatever sort of extreme style of eating. Um, so think about any nutritional advice with that um, idea. And so this idea of a low methionine diet is actually pretty damn simple because essentially what it means is decreasing your intake of animal proteins and uh, Brazil nuts, which pets can't have anyway. Oddly, they are very high in methionine. Um, and in doing this, what you do is deprive, the reason this is being a big thing, so the study in 1974, sorry, I'm kind of circling around, but I'll get back to it. The study in 1974 looked at mice, uh, excuse me, cell cultures, and what they found was that normal healthy cells um, could grow in a culture medium that had no methionine in it. And methionine is an essential amino acid, meaning you have to eat it uh, to, to have sufficient quantity on board. And um, cancer cells could not grow in a culture medium without methionine. So everybody went, hmm, that's interesting. And meanwhile, back at the ranch in the 90s, they did a study in mice, and they looked at mice that had a specific type of colon cancer that was not responsive to the typical treatment of the time, which was 5-fluoro... 5-FU, so the fl fl fluoro fluoroxy, I can, I'm sorry, I can't get the word out today. 5-FU is the name of the drug. Um, and what they found was in mice that uh, were on a low methionine diet, all of a sudden their cancer became responsive to 5-FU and their tumor sizes shrank dramatically. So this is untested in veterinary medicine. It is just starting to be utilized in uh, human side. And so, f Jamie, I'm happy to jump on a call, and this is something that we could talk about for Willie, um, just knowing this is, a, this is experimental. So the idea is that you give the minimum requirement for methionine, according to NRC, uh, which we, we, can, we know, and uh, use other foods to provide the nutrition. So it's not vegan and it's not vegetarian, but it is lower protein. And because we're going to now substitute in carbohydrates as the calorie source, it is easier to keep the weight on than ketosis diet. So this may be something to experiment with if you're if you're willing to jump in and give it a try. So we'll, we can talk through what that might entail. So that's, that's what I know. Um, it, the other thing that is really cool, um, and whoever thought I'd get excited about Neanderthal poop, but I am because they found this, there was another study, which I think Hannah put a link to in the, in the uh, email we sent out this week. Um, but scientists found a cache of um, of Neanderthal poop, um, so you know, 30,000 year old poop samples. And what they were able to do was to sequence the uh, DNA of the bacteria present and identify the species of bacteria, the microbiome, essentially, of Neanderthals. And lo and behold, we all thought they were just meat eaters and you know, they ate it raw and that's blah, 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 blah. No. They're hunter-gatherer hunter society. So they were eating vegetables, plants, uh, they were gathering grains. I mean, they were baking 30,000 years ago, uh, which is kind of a, you know, about the time we showed up, Homo sapiens. So the, the interesting thing is that it turns out that the microbiome of Neanderthals is very similar to our current microbiome. And the reason this is important in terms of dogs is that dogs evolved with Homo sapiens. They showed up about the same time that uh, 
the Neanderthals disappeared. And so there's a lot of theories about that. But they have been eating what we have been eating. And we are uh, omnivores. And we have not been just eating high fat, high meat diets. We've been eating, you know, whatever the hell we could get our hands on, right? Uh, so grains, grasses, vegetables, roots, uh, fruits, meats when we can catch them. So, I mean, that's it. You know, the, the joke about the bumper sticker that says vegetarian is an old Indian word for bad hunter. And basically that's it. You know, if the, if the, uh, if there were not animals, bison around or other game animals around, then you were eating what you could forage. So this lends credence to the idea that the raw diet is actually not the ancestral diet of dogs. Um, and I've been saying this for a lot of years, but it's been rewarding to see more and more of the data come out to, 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 uh, to support this concept. So um, while what I'm saying to you will be viewed as absolute heresy amongst other vets, I think it really is the truth. Um, and we really sustainability is on my mind as it must be on yours if you're experiencing some of the weather effects of climate change we really have to if dogs and cats are already eating almost 30 percent of the conventionally produced animal proteins in the United States we have to change something um, but we have to change it in a more balanced way uh, so that we don't create problems like we have been as far as um, the the uh, you know no grain-free diets they're super super high in legumes that really created havoc with the golden retrievers and other breeds as far as the dilative cardiomyopathy so that's what's on my mind um, and I, I don't know I'm going to be playing with some of the recipes and see how things go too I'll test of course Pepe and Pepe is a cat, so he eats a lot of veggies, but he doesn't eat any starches. So again, this concept is not going to work for cats because they are obligate carnivores. But I think for dogs, we can definitely uh, we can definitely increase the amount of either plant-based proteins or plant-based foods within the diet with uh, not much issue. So Jamie, um, I'll zip you an email and let's see if we can connect uh, this week and, and, uh, and figure this out. But I think that will make your life much simpler with Willie because it sounds like you're really struggling uh, to keep him, keep him healthy and happy. So that's what I've got for you this week. I don't know if anybody else has questions. I think uh, uh, there's one other person on, but that's what I got for you this week. So until next week. Remember, your pet's best health starts in the bowl and give everybody a big hug and kiss for me. Thanks.